Hi. Okay, so we finished the poem, the children, the children, um, the last video, and now I want to pay attention to the shot by Cynthia Ozick. Um, she's a great writer. I love her essays. Um, this there is actually a longer portion version of this shot that has been anthologized, but I'm very happy they chose the shorter one um, because it makes it a lot simpler and a lot faster for us to teach. Okay, before we get started on this one, I do want to give you um, another fact. Somewhere around two-thirds of Jewish people living in Europe at the time of World War II were killed by Nazis. Okay, so this was a systematic genocide that unfortunately worked. If you're interested in films about the Holocaust, um, I would recommend Schindler's List because that's the one everybody watches. The Pianist with Adrian Brody, I would recommend that one above Schindler's List. That one is life-changing. Um, there is also a nine-hour documentary called Shoah. That one is very, that one, it's a documentary and that one's actually worth watching if you have nine hours to, to watch. Um, I have some problems with some of the quote-unquote newer um, Holocaust literature that's been coming out. For example, there was a book that was released entitled um, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. I do have some problems with those, um, but I mean, I'm not going to tell you whether or not you should read them or you shouldn't. Hey, read the book, that's fine. But I do have issues with recommending those. All right, so we'll just get that out right now. There is a film about Auschwitz is by a, um, a director named Uwe, Uwe Boll. He directs really, really bad horror movies. It's about Auschwitz, and I watched the trailer once, and I will never watch it again. Okay, it was, I don't know, it, it's, maybe this isn't what he wanted, but I got the hostile vibe, you know, like the hostile saw sort of vibe from it, and that's something that I just did not want to associate um, with the Holocaust. At the time, I was actually in a Holocaust uh, um, literature class, so I didn't watch it. You all can Google whatever you want, but that's out there, and I haven't watched it, okay? There are other um, very questionable films about the Holocaust out there, which I am not going to discuss on tape. But yeah, so there are things you should read. If you all want any more recommendations, especially when it comes to books, I'd be more than happy to do so, okay? So let's look at the shelf 3436. All right, so a couple of things I want to tell you about this shawl. Actually, just maybe one or two. This is based on documented events, uh, the electrified fences, that children were thrown against electrified fences. Um, and there is quite a bit of magic realism. Okay, meaning that the story continues and the story goes on, right? But with magic realism, there is something mystical there that may or may not be true. Um, and it's woven into the story, so it's not just totally fantastical. Um, Cynthia Ozick does this, Tony Morrison does this, Gabriel Gar Garcia Marquez does this, Isabel Allende does this, okay? So you've seen magic realism, you've probably read it, you just didn't know what it was. Okay, so if we look at 34, 34, Six, sorry, 34, 36, The Shawl by Cynthia Ozick. Okay, we have three major characters. Stella, okay, her, um, Stella, who's a teenager, her mom Rosa, and her sister Magda. Okay, now I want you to pay attention how, sh how um, Ozick describes them, especially the way they look. Stella, cold, cold, the coldness of hell. How they walked on the road together, Rosa with Magda curled up between sore breasts. Magda wound up in the shawl. Sometimes Stella carried Magda, but she was jealous of Magda, a thin girl of 14, too small, with thin breasts of her own. Stella wanted to be wrapped up in a shawl, hidden away, asleep, rocked by March, a baby, round-round, infant in arms. Magda took Rosa's nipple, and Rosa never stopped walking a walking cradle. There was not enough milk. Sometimes Magda stuck air and then screamed. Stella was ravenous. Her knees were tumors on sticks, her elbows chicken bones. In the next paragraph. The face very round, a pocket mirror of a face, but it was not Rosa's bleak complexion, dark like cholera. It was another kind of face altogether. Blue, eyes blue as, as air, smooth feathers of hair nearly as yellow as the star sewn onto Rosa's coat. You could think that she was one of their babies. All right, so we have these three main characters, and they are walking. They are on some kind of march. This is um, incredibly common. 
okay, um, during the Holocaust. So we don't know exactly what kind of um, march they're on, but they are on there and they are cold and they are hungry. And just compare the um, the way that Stella is compared um, is described to the way Magda is described. Magda is described as a much prettier. She has a lighter complexion. She's very um, toward the the rest of the story. You see that she's very quiet. She's very meek. And Stella, they say that she is ravenous. Okay, and I love that word ravenous, right? It means you're ravenous, you'll attack anything, you'll kill anything. And the mom makes an allusion to that later. Um, I think this is a great story and I really enjoy it. And I enjoy teaching it and I enjoy reading it. Because we all have rules. Okay, I would never do this. I would never do that. Okay, there's even a game, right, that you young people play with. I have never. Or I would never. But in a situation that they find themselves in um, to survive, people will do the impossible. Okay, so most of the time we wouldn't think, oh, you know, Stella would never hate her little sister, would never want to eat her little sister. And yet in this situation, it, it happens, something is lost. Okay, the survival instinct will kick in. Um, people will do almost the impossible to survive, and if that means you know, someone else has to suffer, then so be it. This is Stella. She doesn't have the motherly connection that Rosa has with Magda. And even then, I mean, sometimes that connection is gone as well. Let's go to 34, 36. Um, toward the bottom of that last paragraph, the little round head, such a good child, she gave up screaming and sucked now only for the taste of the dry nipple itself. The, the neat grip of tiny gums, one mite of a tooth tip sticking up in the bottom gum, how shining an elfin tombstone of white marble leaning there. Without complaining, Magda relinquished Rosa's teeth first the left, then the right. Both were cracked, not a sniff of milk. The dark crevice extinct, a dead volcano, blind eye, chill mole. So Magda took to the edge, took the, the corner of the shawl and milked it instead. She sucked and she sucked, flooding threats with witness. The shawl's good flavor, milk of linen. All right, this is where the magic realism comes in. Obviously, a shawl cannot um, feed a child, but it's working here. Somehow, by some miracle, by some magic, it works and it makes sense, okay? Because if you've ever seen anyone carrying a child in a shawl, the, kid, the child's like this, right? And if you're carrying a kid, let me tell you, the, kid, the kids grab onto everything. Okay, many, many times I've had my kids grab my hair or grab my necklaces or um, they'll, they'll do that. Okay, so this is something that's very natural, very normal. Okay. We find out that Magda is 15 months old and Stella is 14. Okay, so they're, they are very, very young. Uh, 30, 34, 37. Let's look at right here. Uh, 34, 37, the second full paragraph toward the bottom. They were in a place without pity. All pity was annihilated in Rosa. She looked at Stella's bones without pity. She was sure that Stella was waiting for Magda to die so she could put her teeth into the little thighs. Okay, this is a great tragedy. This is a tragedy of these genocides, of these, um, of these occasions, because this is... A mother is supposed to care for a child, right? Is supposed to care for both of them. And right now she is, it, she has no pity for Stella. Okay, she just doesn't really like her very much that we can tell. But she doesn't, she's afraid because um, that Magda is going to be eaten by Stella. Okay, when she dies because she's hungry. Rosa knew Magda was going to die very soon. She should have been dead already, but she had been buried away deep inside the magic shawl, mistaken there for a shivering mound of Rosa's breast. Rosa clung to the shawl as if it only covered herself. No one took it away from her. Magda was mute. She never cried. Rosa hid her in the barracks under the shawl, but she knew that one day someone would inform, or one day someone, not even Stella, would steal Magda to eat her. Okay, that's something that is very tragic and yet we know this happened okay as i said the survival instinct in people is very strong and sometimes um cannibalism occurs okay when magda began to walk Ros when magda began to walk rosa knew that magda was going to die very soon something something would happen okay go to the next paragraph <coughs> Magda was quiet, but her eyes were horribly alive like blue tigers. She watched, 
Sometimes she laughed. It seemed to laugh, but how could it be? Magda had never seen anyone laugh. Still, Magda laughed at her shawl when the wind blew its covers. The bad wind with pieces of black in it. What does that mean? The bad wind with pieces of black in it? If they're in a concentration camp, what do you think that is? The bad wind with pieces of black in it that made Stella and Rose's eyes tear. Magda's eyes were always clear and tearless. She watched like a tiger. She guarded her shawl. No one could touch it. Only Rosa could touch it. Stella was not allowed. Okay. Um, the wind with the pieces of black um, were... It was the wind coming from the crematoriums. If you've ever burned anything in a, in a chimney, I have a chimney outside. If you ever burn anything, they tell you to be careful because sometimes the flames can go up, okay? And if you're burning paper, sometimes the, the um, small bits of ashes will go up. This is what they were feeling. This is the wind that they were feeling that would make their eyes tear, okay? So they were, they had a wind around them that had um, ashes to it, human ashes to it. Then Stella took the shawl away and made Magda die. Afterwards, Stella said, I was cold. And afterwards, she was always cold, always. The cold went into her heart. Rosa saw Stella's heart was cold. Okay, this is a very, very selfish act. Incredibly selfish, right? We would want to hate Stella for doing this, for, for condemning her sister. But like I said, guys, remember, this is survival. And sometimes to survive, people do um, commit some atrocities. Would this been atrocity? Yes. Would Stella have done this if um, her, if this wasn't a concentration camp? Probably not. They probably would have been fighting for the shawl, but I don't think Stella would have wanted to kill her sister. But yet, this 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 um, act of selfishness, something that outside would have been a nothing major, leads to her sister's death here. Okay. And I really love the line that she was always 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 cold after that okay so that's her punishment that no matter that she has the shawl now but the shawl isn't going to work it's magic that it worked on magda because it's a special shawl rosa saw and pursued oh, but already magda was in the square outside the barracks in the jolly light it was the roll call arena um if you haven't studied a lot about the holocaust every morning and some and most afternoons i believe most afternoons um the prisoners would be called out and they would have to stand in the in the center arena for hours while the roll call was done. It didn't matter if it was raining, it didn't matter if it was hot, it didn't matter if it was stormy, if it was snowy, it didn't matter, they had to stand there. Okay, so this is where the little girl, she's kind of toddling over there, if you can imagine the little kid toddling. Okay, um, look at 3438 when she's yelling ma, ma. This was the first noise Magda had ever sent from her throat since drying up, since the drying up of Rosa's nipples. Ma. Good say ma. Again, Magda was wavering in the perilous, perilous, I'm sorry, um, Magda was wavering in the perilous sunlight of the arena, scr scribbling with such pitiful little bent sh shins. Rosa saw. She saw that Magda was grieving for the loss of her shawl. She saw that Magda was going to die. Okay, a tide of commands hammered in Rosa's nipples. Fetch, get, bring. But she did not know which to go after first, Magda or the shawl. If she jumped out into the arena to snatch Magda up, the howling would not stop because Magda would still not have the shawl. But if she ran back into the barracks to find the shawl and if she found it and if she came after Magda holding it and shaking it, then she would get Magda back. Magda would be put, put, put the shawl back in her mouth and turn dumb again. Okay, so that's the ideal, right? The shawl will protect her. But the shawl doesn't have the magic anymore, right? Okay. Rosa entered the dark. It was easy to discover the shawl. Stella was heaped under it, sleeping, asleep in her thin bones. Rosa tore the shawl free and flew. She could fly. She was only air into the arena. Okay, and we have this um, sort of convoluted ending in 34, 39, okay, because she has the shawl, and the only thing she wants to do is get her little girl back, okay, because she's been taking, such, she's been taking care of her. 34, 39. Far off, very far, Magda leaned across her air-filled belly, reaching out with the rods of her arms. She was high up, elevated, riding someone's shoulder. But the shoulder that carried Magda was not coming toward Rosa in the shawl. It was drifting away. The speck, of, the speck of Magda was moving more and more into the smoky distance. Above the, sho the, the shoulder, 
a, a hel helmet gl glinted. The light tapped the helmet and it sparkled into a goblet. Below the helmet, a black body like a domino and a black and a pair of black boots hurled themselves in the direction of the electrified fence. The electric voices began to, char to chatter wildly. Mama, Mama, they all hung together. How far Magda was from Rosa now across the whole square, past a dozen barracks and all the way to the other side. She was no bigger than a moth. All at once Magda was swimming through the air. The whole of Magda traveled through loftiness. She looked like a butterfly touching a silver vine. And the moment Magda's feathered round head and her pencil legs and balloonish belly and zigzag arms splashed against the fence. The steel voices went mad in their growling, urging Rosa to run, run to the spot where Magda had fallen from her flight against the electrified fence. But of course, Rosa did not obey them. She only stood because if she ran, they would shoot, and if she tried to pick up the sticks of Magda's body, they would shoot, and if she let the wolf screech ascending now through the ladder of her skeleton break out, they would shoot. So she took Magda's shawl and filled her own mouth with it, stuffed it and stuffed it in until she was swallowing up the wolf's screech and tasting the cinnamon and almond depth of Magda's saliva and Rosa drank Magda's shawl until it dried. All right, so that was a hell of an ending, wasn't it? Um, I'm sorry guys, my throat is really dry today. Um, so that was, that's, that's a hell of an ending at the end. I mean, we knew that she was going to die. This isn't going to end well. Uh, but the way Ozik describes Magda as sort of flying off, right? We see that her, um, mom describes her hair as being very, like, feathery. And she's flying and someone's carrying her. She's flying through the sky, which sounds very majestic until you realize that she's flying straight toward the electrical fence, slams into it, and is electrocuted, okay? And Rosa her first reaction is to want to run out, right? Common, you see a child in danger, you're going to run out um, to make sure the child is all right. But she doesn't because she knows that if she runs out, um, she knows that she's going to get shot. And eventually the self-preservation is much stronger than going out and trying to get her daughter's body. Um, again, do we judge her as badly as, as much as we judge Stella? Do we judge Stella? These are the questions that Cynthia Ozick's worth works bring up okay where do we stand on this do we feel pity for both do we don't we do we hate both do we hate stella do we hate rosa do we wonder how magda stayed alive for all this time okay this is something that will never will never be known but that's the ending and i really love the story and i love how powerful it is okay and i've never seen shawls the same way after um after this story okay but it, it's it's great and i love the um, the, the um, imagery of cinnamon and almond and how it tasted to this little girl but I hope that you all um, enjoyed the story and it's just throwing some questions out there for you all to discuss if you so choose to okay. how are we doing in time? 10 minutes Okay, we have just enough time to start maps because I know that this is the one that you all want to go ahead and start. And like I said, we're going to follow mouse. So you have three different files for mouse. You have mouse one, which is 16 pages. The second part of mouse is seven, and the third part is 27. This is this seems like a lot, but it's really not because I'm only going to um to push out in um I'm only going to concentrate on a few things. Okay, so the way this is going to go is you're going to have the files in front of you and I'll say okay guys go ahead and look at page five in the first file and that's how we're going to go for it okay um so we're gonna have to go slow all right hang on okay um this is my copy of the complete mouse I think I've shown it to you before it is tearing I just noticed that it's tear that the binding is coming off I don't think I'll be able to fix it I think I need a, n a new one it survived graduate school in a couple of conferences so I think I have earned a new one the first thing I want you to look at is in part one of our mouse readings you will see the cover okay the complete mouse you see that's a complete mouse you see the swastika with um, the Hitler like um, cat and then the little two mice. I want you all to pay attention to the faces of the mice. This is where I think part of the genius of the story lies. Lies is look at their faces. Look at their little mouse 
Look at their little eyes and look at their little noses. Okay, they have the little whiskers here. He has his little head right here. Okay, this is something that gets your attention and even if you don't like um, mice, it's still very touching, okay, because you sort of want to protect them. That's the image that you get right here, okay, because it's obvious that they're scared and of course with the swastika and the Hitler, um, the Hitler cat. When this book was published in Germany, um, they had to get special permission because in Germany it is illegal to um, show the swastika anywhere. They're really, really strict when it comes to um, this, this sort of um, paraphernalia. So they had to get like a special, like, special permission, and I'm not even sure if they were able to show this. Okay, um, but yeah. Anyway, isn't that that's very sweet? I think that's very um, sweet of the cover. A couple of facts on mouse that I want you all to know. Let's see. Okay, so Mouse, the first part of Mouse was published between 18, 1980 and 90, 1980 and 90 through 91 and it was serialized. This wins the Pulitzer Prize in 92, the Special Award in Letters, the Eisner Award, and the Harvey Award. Okay, this had a very positive reception here in the United States, incredibly positive reception in Germany, not so much in Israel, and not so much in Poland. Okay, the poll the Poland and the Poles had a huge, huge issues with the way that the Polish um, citizens were depicted in mouse and that they were um, drawn as pigs. They were very, very angry about this. Okay, they still are pretty pissed. That's all we'll say about it, okay? Mouse is considered to be part of the big three in um, graphic novels. It is Alan Moore's Watchmen, uh, Frank Miller's the, De the Dark Knight Returns, and Mouse. Okay, this story has um, anthropomorphic um, aspects to it. We know that the mice are Jews, the Nazis are cats, the Poles are pigs, which we've talked about already, the Americans are dogs, the Swedes are elks, the French are frogs. You could just go in there. And I think the British are cods. I think they're fish. I have to look into that right now. It's not part of our reading. Okay, um, so yeah, this is Mouse. So let's open up the file, the first one, Mouse 1. Okay, you're going to see the cover there. Um, go ahead and look at pages 5 and 6, which should come up. Okay, and do you all remember in Tim O'Brien's story last time when we were talking about friendship? Okay, what is true friendship? Okay, what well, joke goes that? Um, Okay, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna gonna say that incredibly morbid joke. But there was one that real friends help you move, right? Real friends will go pick you up. Real friends. Okay, so right here, if you look at page five and six, okay, you have this little boy skating. Okay, you see these little mice skating, and um, the narrator's skate comes loose and he falls, right? And he's a rotten egg, and he's really sad because his friends took off, and he's crying, and he walks into where his dad's working. Look at um, page six. And the dad says, Artie, come and hold this a minute while I saw. Okay. He's crying. And then the dad says, Why do you cry, Artie? Hold better on the wood. And the little boy says, I, I fell and my friends skated away without me. And he stops sighing. Friends? Your friends? You left them together in a room with no food for a week. Then you could see what is friends. Okay, and that reminds me of O'Brien and what friends will do, right? What did friends do in O'Brien's story is they pulled Kiawa's um, body out of the out of um, the ground. Okay, and I want you all to pay attention to this because there is a distance here between the the father and his son. Okay, because the little boy comes up to him and expects the father to say, "Oh, don't worry, they'll come back," or sort of just um, take away the sting of his friends leaving him. And the dad doesn't com com comfort him. If anything, he says, "They're not your friends. Don't worry about it. That's not what friends do." Okay, um, so there, in right there, um, Spiegelman does lay the foundation for the rest of Mouse. Okay, obviously um, he's going to portray his father the way his father was, and that is one of the great um, I guess criticisms against this book is that um, Mr. Spiegelman just is very, very, um, he's, he's not apologetic about his dad. He writes about his dad, he portrays his dad exactly the way his dad was, okay? And he makes no excuse about it. He doesn't make an excuse about it. Um, by the way, I don't know, I probably told you Val about 50 times that I met Mr. Spiegelman. Really nice guy, had an awesome reception at UTEP, and I really wish he'd come back. All right, if we stay on that file, um, we are skipping around a lot, I'm sorry, I couldn't, um, I couldn't really 
cram everything um, I wanted to into this, I'm sorry, into this file. But the next um, page has, it's page 32 and it has um, Artie, um, it has Artie's dead blood and his wife Anya having a little boy, right? By October of 1937, um, his first son Rishi, Rishi was born. Okay, so they have a little boy. I want you all to see that the little mouse is born with a little tail. Okay, and he's crying and then the little Polish nurse is holding him up. Okay, because she's a pig. She's Polish. Okay, that's what he has them. Okay, and you find out right here, of course, the dad says, you never knew him. He didn't come out from the war. And he says, yes, I did. Yes, I, I know. Um, beef, I know we're about to end this, this video, I mean this portion, but I want you all to see the... Um, when the dad says, after you were born, you were you were very premature. The doctors thought you wouldn't live. I found a specialist. What saved you? He had to break your arm to take you from Anya's belly. When you were a tiny baby, your arm always jumped up like so. We joked and called you Heil Hitler. Okay, obviously, this is incredibly black humor. Okay, this is black humor. This is um very gallows humor, but it's... It's how it's what this Holocaust survivor does. Is he this is this is his type of humor? Okay, Hitler caused all of this um, destruction and this death in his life, but he still managed to say, "Hey, you know, you did your arm like this, so he calls you Hitler." Um, so that's the kind of humor he has. And um, let's go ahead and start the other video because I know we're almost done.